I want to welcome you all here today. My name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class. I am just so grateful to have you all, all of the ladies that are coming back. I felt like we were coming back to school today. It was just such a glorious moment to see you walk in. I hope that you all feel the same joy. I'm so grateful for any of our newcomers, anyone who is here or coming back to BSF for this particular revamp study. So grateful that you have decided to join us and to study with us to the glory of God. I have... Uh, I do want to just recognize the class staff. Donna is upstairs, and so I knew that she would be busy. Donna is our uh, class administrator, so praise the Lord for you, sister. Amen. Amen. And then Angie is our substitute teaching leader. Angie, would you stay, stand and wave at the ladies? Amen. Amen. I know that some of you all know Quillacy, and Quillacy is our children's supervisor, and of course that's where she is now, supervising with the children, and we're so blessed, blessed to have this particular class staff. I also want to recognize our administrative leaders. They are on, I mean, on the job. They also are serving with our host. So grateful for you all. And so grateful for our children's leaders that are taking care of our children. Praise the Lord as well as our group leaders. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, shout outs coming. Brad, Elizabeth, praise the Lord. All right, we could not do what we do without Brad, who uh, is here with the church, and Miss Elizabeth, uh, his assistant. We are just so grateful. She is an answer to prayers. We were praying uh, last year many a times that Brad would have an assistant, and look at what he did, and she's a beautiful lady. So grateful to have you. Amen. All right, ladies, so I do have one announcement. And it's that we have a class-wide fellowship next week, okay? So next week, you're going to come at 9 o'clock, and you'll go directly to your class, and you'll have a class-wide fellowship. The children's area will open at 8.50, so you can drop your children off at that time. All right? Now, I want to take an opportunity to just tell you a little bit these are a, a few opening thoughts. So our study this year is called People of the Promise, Kingdom Divided. Who are the people of the promise? Do you know that the people of the promise, in biblical times, they're talking about what? The Israelites. But those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we are the people of the promise. So think about that. And when we talk about a divided kingdom, that is as relevant in biblical times as it is today. And our desire is not to be a divided kingdom, but to what? Look toward the heavenly kingdom, the one kingdom, the kingdom of God, heavenly Father. So what I want to remind you is that as we study, don't just study this thinking that we're talking about people long ago. Think about yourself. Make this word relevant to the times. I'm looking here at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, and I'll read it to you as soon as my eyes adjust. <laughs> it says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Amen, amen. So, that means that if you're justified through Jesus Christ, then you are, again, the people of the promise. This study is going to cover challenging but important period of Israel's history. After Solomon's failures, the nation divided into two kingdoms, 
the northern kingdom of Israel, which were the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom of Judah, the two tribes. Though some of Judah's kings called the people to seek God, a long list of mostly evil kings led both nations to deep idolatry. With persistent love, God sent prophet after prophet to call the people back to faith and obedience. Ultimately, this study reveals God's persistent love for his people and the lengths he will go to fulfill his promises and purposes in their lives. We are these people. Look for what God is going to do specifically for you through his word. I had a choice to make this summer and it may be a dilemma that some of you have. God has called me for something specific. He has asked me to do something. And I had the choice to make. Was I going to do? What was I going to do? What he asked me to do? It was a choice that I had to make. He's saying, you get to make the choice. But if you don't do what I called you to do, I'll get someone else to do it. And I decided, I don't want anyone to do what he's called for me to do. He told me to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And he also told me to tell my people to obey my commands and my decrees. And for you all that believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that should be the same thing for you. It should be exactly the same thing. So you're going to have to make a choice. We have the privilege of studying together this year an often neglected but amazing relevant portion of God's word. God's word was relevant in biblical times, and it is relevant what? Today. If you study this word for beyond just the head knowledge, but a heart transformation, this word will be relevant. It will speak to you in your current circumstances. But it is not going to come from a head knowledge. It's going to come from a heart transformation, ladies. So when you study, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you specifically through God's word, to give you an all time word from God. He will do just that. Amen. Surrender today to the call that God has for your life. As we study the storyline of the kings and, and, kings and chronicles and the prophets who entered the scene during the portion of Israel's history, there is much for us to learn and apply. God, tender heart and continuous, he, continuous reach for rebellious people is still offering us hope today. There is a song, and this song is by C.C. Winans, and we'll play it at the end of the lecture. But it's called The Goodness of God. It says, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me all my days. I have been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and the darkness night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived for the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. 
Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything, O oh Lord. His goodness is running after, it's running after you. You have got to decide whether you're going to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if you have, then draw a line in the sand today and walk in the ways that he has called you to. Don't be lukewarm, but be all in. Just throw, I could throw my head in right now. Throw it in. Surrender to him. Give him your everything because his goodness, it's running after. It's running after you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We have a provided lecture today. This lecture is provided by one of our board members, Dr. Mark Bailey. Dr. Mark Bailey, uh, you may have also known that he is a part of Dallas Theological Seminary, okay? And he has been the Bible, ex, ex, I think it's exposition um, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I think he's also been the president. But we are so grateful to have him on our board of directors. When we had a launch where all of the teaching leaders attended from all over the world this year, we ascended upon Arlington, Texas. Amen. He was about to speak, and he was in tears at the sight of all of these teaching leaders gathered in person. It was tears of joy for the beauty as he looked upon us, my Lord. So I just want to tell you that this is a very special man, and we are so blessed to hear from him today. We're going to go ahead and get started. There is going to be a couple of things going up, probably his outline. Feel free to write this outline out at the end of the lecture. It'll also be provided on the website where you can see his outline if you're not able to get the entire outline in this time frame. All right. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Vying for the influential supremacy in the shaping of the spiritual part of our lives are four competing authorities. For some, it's our own intellect and rationality. If it does not make sense to our minds, we will not believe. For others, decisions are made on the basis of their emotions. How one feels directs their choices. If it feels good, they do it. For those raised in a religious setting, it may even be the ecclesiastical tradition that controls behavior. One may simply have been raised to believe and live in a certain way. The problem is that all three of these can be plagued by human error and bias. The mind, the heart, or human tradition not led by the Spirit of God through the Word of God are always prone to deceit and defection. One of the great themes brought forward by the Reformation is that of sola scriptura, which means that the Bible and the Bible alone is our authority. The following statement is found on the BSF website, introducing the doctrinal framework for Bible Study Fellowship. And I quote, the leadership of Bible Study Fellowship, including the board of directors, is committed without reservation to this statement of faith. In fact, the very first article of that statement expresses our commitment to the authority of the Bible. The first article is the Bible. And it states, and I quote, We believe that the 66 books of Holy Scripture, as originally given, are in their entirety the Word of God verbally inspired and wholly without error in all that they declare, and therefore are the supreme and final authority for faith and life. Psalm 119, 160 reads, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. And Paul, writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 states, and we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, 
you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which indeed is at work in you who believe. As we begin this new year of study, and this new study of the people of the promised kingdom divided, I want to talk to you about two major themes, the authority of the Bible in general, and the relevancy of the Old Testament in particular. Since the Bible is the Word of God, let me begin by making three statements. The authority of the Bible is rooted in the authorship of the Bible. The inerrancy of the Bible is rooted in the inspiration of the Bible. And the profitability of the Bible is rooted in the power of the Bible. There are three great passages in the Bible about the Bible that help us answer three questions as to why we see the Bible as our sole authority. Question number one, how did we get our Bible? The origin of the Bible is described in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is not sourced in the intuition of human authors. The Bible is not sourced in the interpretation of human listeners. Peter tells us that the Bible is supernaturally sourced in the Holy Spirit and communicated through human authors. Literally, in the Greek New Testament, verse 21 reflects this emphatic truth by the very order of its words. If I could translate it, but by the Holy Spirit, being moved or born along, spoke from God, men. This is the process of inspiration. God spoke by his spirit through human authors and the result is the Word of God. The second question we can ask and answer is what is the nature of the Bible? The nature and purpose of the Bible are clearly seen in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, where Paul reminded Timothy how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, passe graphe in Greek, every part or every passage of scripture. Graphe, it means writing. It's used 51 times in the New Testament. 49 times it refers to the Old Testament scriptures and two times to New Testament scriptures. The phrase God breathed, or as some have translated it, inspired of God, is a translation of one unique Greek word, theopneustos. It's the only time it's found in all of the scriptures. It comes from three words. Theos is a word for God. Pneuma is a word for breath or for, here I think, the Holy Spirit. And tos is a suffix meaning the result of. Hence, all scripture, every scripture, is the result of the Spirit of God, which correlates perfectly to what we saw in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Listen again to what Paul said about these sacred writings. They're able to make one wise unto salvation. They're given by the inspiration of God through the Spirit of God. They're profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. They help the servant of God become thoroughly prepared for every good work. A third question critical for our purpose is how can we know what God meant by what God said? The first key to understanding the scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. This passage connects the links of God's communication chain, revelation, inspiration, and illumination, all three of which are necessary for our correct understanding in the application of the Bible, and all three involve the role of the Spirit. Revelation is that process by which God made known to humanity that which otherwise could never be known. The passage begins, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Inspiration, the second link, is that process by which God so directed the human authors of Scripture without destroying their individuality, their personal interests, or their literary style, his complete thought toward humanity 
was recorded without error in the words of the original manuscripts. What Paul is speaking to the Corinthians are the thoughts of God brought by the Spirit into human language. Verse 13 states it this way, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. The third link in our divine communication chain is illumination. Illumination is that process whereby the Spirit makes possible for us to know and willing to accept the right understanding of the Word of God. This is described in verse 12 and in verses 14 through 16. Paul says, What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. The authority of the Bible is rooted in the authorship of the Bible. The inerrancy of the Bible is rooted in the inspiration of the Bible. And the profitability of the Bible is rooted in the prophetic nature of the Bible. In addition to the argument of the Bible itself for its own authority by right of divine origin, all we need to do is read the New Testament to see how Jesus and the apostles endorsed the authority of those portions of the Bible available to them. Jesus cited 14 different books of the Old Testament during his ministry. He quoted scripture three times in resisting Satan's temptations. In Luke 24, 44, he affirmed the authority of all three parts of the Hebrew Bible and all that they predicted about him would be fulfilled. He affirmed the abiding nature of scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And he even affirmed the historicity of such events as the creation, Adam and Eve, the flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the miracle of Jonah. There are two sets of passages that show how the New Testament writers viewed the authenticity and authority of the Old Testament. There are passages where the Old Testament records the words of God. The New Testament affirmed that those sayings are sacred scripture. What God says, the Bible says. And there's another set of passages where what the Old Testament states, the New Testament writers attribute to the utterances of God. What the Bible says, God says. As Benjamin B. Warfield concludes, the two sets of passages together thus show an absolute identification in the minds of these writers of Scripture with the speaking of God. Therefore, the authority of both Testaments is mutually confirming. What God says, the Bible says, and what the Bible says is what God says. We're now ready to talk about the relevancy of this year's study in the Old Testament, the relevancy of the Hebrew Scriptures in particular. It will come as no surprise that the Old Testament Scriptures comprise 75% of our Bible. The Old Testament is foundational to the events and teachings of the New Testament. In reality, one cannot absolutely understand the rich theology of the New Testament without the Jewish background of the Old Testament. I would like to suggest seven reasons why the Old Testament is absolutely relevant for all of us living on this side of the cross. Reason number one, the Old Testament records God's self-revelation of his unchanging character for which he is to be known, loved, and obeyed. His power, his holiness, his unconditional love, his unending faithfulness, God is both creator and covenant maker. Knowing what God is like enables us to better worship him for who he is and what he's done. Listen to God's self-description to Moses from Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's our God, and he does not change. Therefore, understanding God's character and his ways in the Old Testament teaches us what is also true about our Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Reason number two, 
The Old Testament introduces us to critical Bible doctrines, which are the cornerstones to the Christian faith. The doctrines of creation, righteousness, sin, judgment, grace, and salvation all find their foundation in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we have an extensive historical testimony to God's patience, His grace, and His mercy with His people Israel. But we also see His standards of holiness, which demanded Israel's discipline and ultimately their exile from the land. Reason number three, especially appropriate to the Old Testament, and especially our study of the prophetical books, are the alternating oracles of judgment and salvation. In the former, judgment is warranted for unbelief and disobedience. In the latter, the blessings of God are promised for faith and obedience. In two New Testament passages, Paul brings this into view. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, he writes, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And in 1 Corinthians 10 11, he states, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. In summary, the prophetic message is, there is hope on the one hand, but warning on the other. In good times and bad, when the world finds itself in chaos, order and perspective are still possible. If we heed the lessons to be learned, if we endure under trial, encouragement and hope are still possible. Positive examples are lives we should emulate. Negative examples reveal the futility of living life apart from the guidance of God. This leads us to number four. The Old Testament sets forth covenant ideals for human flourishing, love, obedience, righteousness, and the ethical responsibilities of justice and mercy. Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 are the headwaters for the two great commandments of loving God wholeheartedly and loving others sacrificially. And as Jesus taught, these two summarize the purpose and essence of the entire law and the prophets. The poetical books of the Old Testament are, by their very nature, virtually timeless. The Psalms provide the lyrics of lament and the hymnody of praise. The wisdom books contain biblical imperatives as well as human observations. Not only is God's truth right, His way is always best. Living according to God's wisdom on the horizontal plane should be the natural reflection of the worship one has for God on the vertical plane. And for the secret of living in community, Micah 6, 8 reminds Israel, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. A fifth reason we should study the Old Testament is that it details the near and far purposes of God for Israel and the rest of the nations. The Bible shows Israel's place in the overall plan of God and in his unfolding plan of redemption for the human race. It records the nation's origin, their history, and their exile from the land, their return, and the promises for their ultimate restoration. God chose to use Israel for three major reasons. They were to be a light for the nations, a repository, not a depository, but a repository of the truth, and a channel of the Messiah. God's elective choice of Israel was not for their own supremacy, but for their representational ministry. They were chosen to be a kingdom of priests with the end goal of their intercession and proclamation to represent God to the rest of the world. That idealized goal as to why God chose Jacob and not Esau is found in Malachi chapter 1, especially verse 5, where he concludes, Great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. Old Testament prophecies included both short-term and long-term predictions. Therefore, the undeniable fulfillment of the short-term predictions serve to assure that the long-term prophecies will be fulfilled just as faithfully. Without a doubt, the major relevancy of the Old Testament is the prediction and preview it gives to the coming Messiah. And that's our reason number six. The Old Testament promises in great detail the coming of the Messiah and his roles as both sovereign and savior in the kingdom and redemptive purposes of God. Luke 24, 44 records Jesus' explanation to his disciples that all three sections of the Hebrew Bible, like we said earlier, 
contained prophecies that he would ultimately fulfill. He said, and I quote, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Without the Old Testament, we would not even know that there would be a Messiah, nor why he needed to come into the world. And as my friend Ken Boa states, when the Messianic prophecies are combined, the prophetic doorway becomes so narrow that only one person can fit through. Starting in Genesis 3.15, Scripture begins to talk about what Jesus will do, both to reclaim a kingdom usurped by Satan and provide redemption for a fallen humanity. Without the Old Testament, we would not properly understand the person and work of Christ. According to Hebrews, Jesus is not only our high priest, but he himself is the very sacrifice that he as the great high priest offered. He offered himself for us. And finally, reason number seven, to return to that great text of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, what Paul described as all scripture was primarily a reference to the Old Testament. That was the Bible of his day. Because of its authorship, it is said to be profitable. That profitability is realized when we allow it to change our lives, to conform us to Christ's likeness, and to equip us for every good work of the ministry to which God calls us. In closing, I want to leave you with one of my favorite verses, if not my favorite. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Summarized in this one verse are the critical components for defining the dynamic and maturing Christian experience. It is God's transformation of the life of the believer into the glorious image of Christ through the Word of God, by the power of the Spirit of God, in fellowship with the people of God. This, my friend, is in reality what BSF is all about. May this year be the best year of our spiritual growth experience that we've ever had. Testing one, testing two, praise God. Yes, that, that, that was an awesome, awesome message. Ladies, let's pray. Got a few closing thoughts for you, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, just so grateful that you were able uh, to just speak to us, Lord, through Dr. Mike Bailey, Lord. I thank you for the message that he uh, gave us, Lord. We are so grateful for the word of God. Uh, again, one of the things that he said was that that transformation could only take place through the Holy Spirit. God's word is relevant as it was in that time. It is relevant today, Lord. I pray that the transformation that will take place in our hearts will be led through the Holy Spirit and that we would be able to give you all the honor and all the glory. Lord, we know we are nothing without you and let us desire to surrender all to you, Lord, that you would do with us what you want to do, Lord. We are so grateful that we serve an on-time God who sits on high but looks down low, Lord. I pray that your blessings would be upon each of these ladies, Lord, and forth into their families, Lord. Let them pass down the word to their families, Lord. Let it go to the next generation and the next generation that they would rise up and call you Lord, and they would make disciples that are going forth in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We are so grateful to be your followers. If there is anyone in earshot who doesn't know you, in the pardon of their sins, Lord, let them reach out to their group leader, to myself, Lord, that we would walk them through the steps of assurance that they would come to know you today and be forever saved to have eternal life with you. Lord, we are so blessed and we are so grateful for your presence. We give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Lord, I have a, I have a few um, re closing remarks, ladies. That message, we are just so blessed for what headquarters gives us the opportunity, the study resources. But the most important thing is that you study the Word of God, that you ask God to show you what he has for you as you study. 
that he speaks directly to you. And so I want to leave you with a couple of things. That is, is that he knows the challenges and the joys that you will encounter this year. He will use these Old Testament books and prophets to speak to you directly. He will provide you with personalized encouragement, conviction, and challenges when you need it the most. I pray that you see this word as an on-time work for God, and we give him all the glory and all the honor for what he has done today and what he will continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen.